You know, I hit him in the artery, I hit him in the neck, I hit him in the groin, I hit him in the lung. In the fastest way possible, you know, so they teach you kill shots is what we call them, which of course is a lot of places I ended up hitting Pablo. And if he just stays the rest of his life in prison, he's gonna get to live his life in jail. I'm gonna go get him. I just couldn't handle it. The entire north side of town is searched. Police later arrest two women, but the man armed and extremely dangerous is nowhere to be seen. Trying to beat the gallows. And John Henry Ramirez's case was going to be very tough. It took us less than an hour to come to decision. This is the story of how John Henry Ramirez, a 20-year-old ex-Marine, beat and knife Pablo Castro, a father of nine and convenience store worker of 14 years, 29 times to his end for a mere $1.25 in Corpus Christi, Texas, on the night of July 14, 2004. Ramirez started using drugs at the age of 12, and at the time he saw Castro taking out the garbage that fateful night. He was in the midst of a multi-day binge of alcohol, Xanax, and cocaine, which he was desperately trying to prolong. And that's what kind of stamped me out, and I realized, you know, I saw how hurt he was, I, you know, he was bleeding everywhere, and I was like, um, I, I knew I had went too far with this dude smacking him around. So I go over there, I separate him, I start fighting him. I had stabbed him in the neck. I was in one of the trucks talking on the cell phone, I hear like a scuffle or something, I look and Angie is there. Last breaths. On the night of July 14, 2004, John Henry Ramirez brutally thrashed Pablo Castro, a convenience store worker in Corpus Christi, Texas, knifing and beating him 29 times for a measly $1.25. Ramirez, who had a history of drug use and was under the influence of alcohol, Xanax and cocaine at the time, fled the scene with a small amount of money. He managed to escape to Mexico where he remained at large for a few years. However, he was eventually captured by FBI agents near the U.S.-Mexico border in Brownsville, Texas. Ramirez's two female accomplices who had assisted him in other robberies the same night were also arrested and sentenced to long prison terms. In Ramirez's own words, he recounted that he was in a car in the parking lot when he saw his friend struggling with Castro. Ramirez went out to intervene but Castro hit him in the mouth which angered him. He then took out a knife and began to attack Castro. Ramirez claimed that he was always under the influence of drugs at the time and had anger management issues. He only realized the gravity of the situation when he saw his face on the news the next morning and learned that Castro had perished. Ramirez fled to Mexico after the incident. Starting a family After spending time in Mexico, Ramirez believed he was safe and got married, eventually having a son. He returned to Brownsville, Texas with his partner to give birth, but suspected that those who helped him escape had given him away. In 2007, he was arrested, and after years of legal battles, Texas gave him capital punishment, 15 years later. Texas is one of the 27 states in the U.S. that still applies capital punishment, and Ramirez's case went through a lengthy process of appeals and debates over whether he deserved to live. At his trial in 2008, he even asked his attorneys to withdraw all additional mitigation witnesses and read a verse from Psalm 51-3. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. The jury announced capital punishment for him unanimously. Texas is one of the states that still use capital punishment as actively as ever. His sin remained ever before him in court papers and media reports, and his sentence left him with feelings of guilt and shame for the rest of his life. What he had done had permanently transformed so many lives, including his own, and the essence of his sentence painted the balance of the years to come after his crime. An unexpected change. While on the row, Ramirez encountered Pastor Dana Moore and members of Corpus Christi's Second Baptist Church through the pastor's prison ministry in 2017. He joined the church even though he was a Messianic Jew. On September 8, 2021, Ramirez was scheduled to be fatally punished. Having been changed by Moore's ministry, Ramirez requested that Moore pray for him and lay his hands on him. Despite Texas officials allowing Moore to attend the punishment, they prohibited him from touching the prisoner. Ramirez's case for religious rights reached the U.S. Supreme Court, and on the night of his scheduled punishment, the justice halted the procedure while Ramirez was waiting in a holding room after he had finished his last meal. Delaying his punishment the Castro family was deeply upset and outraged over the situation. Aaron Castro, one of Pablo's sons, expressed that he did not care if Ramirez wanted a priest to bless him before his punishment. 
and that was not the issue at hand. He was more concerned about why the process continued to be delayed repeatedly. According to Aaron, they always hoped that this year, this year, would be no more stays of punishment or delays, but something always happened. He called Ramirez a repugnant individual who deserved to be punished, just as Clarence Thomas was the only one who disagreed and believed that Ramirez was intentionally trying to delay his punishment. Despite Ramirez's efforts, the state of Texas eventually caught up with him on October 5, 2021. However, due to a mistake by an employee in the office of Nueces County District Attorney Mark Gonzalez, a request for a new punishment date was mistakenly filed without Gonzalez's consultation. Gonzalez later requested to withdraw the warrant, but the motion was denied, and the Texas Board of Pardons and Paroles voted against commuting Ramirez's punishment. At this point, all legal options available to save Ramirez had been exhausted. Stop trying to get around the situation. There's no way out. You need to be Things are done in certain situations that I could have went the other way and it would have totally changed the outcome. You know? Stop crying. He did the crime and now it's time for him to get his ultimate sentence. So you always think uh, this is going to be the year. This is the time. There won't be another stay of execution. There won't be another delay. A painful life. Ramirez, who had led a harsh and unforgiving life, was equally harsh and unforgiving toward himself. He didn't claim to have undergone a dramatic transformation, only that he experienced a spiritual change that brought him back to follow Christ. When asked about his past, he acknowledged that he knew God existed, but he was not living right and wasn't trying to be good. As his punishment approached, Ramirez leaned on Pastor Moore for spiritual guidance. After Ramirez's punishment, Pastor Moore was described as sounding emotionally drained. He revealed that Ramirez never forgave himself for taking Castro's life and had recently considered not having anyone there to support him as a form of penance. Ramirez was genuinely remorseful to the extent that he felt that it might be better for Castro's family if he didn't have anyone there with him and let it be about them and their need for peace in their lives spiritually or, or, or in their belief not too many people are that far along uh, you know a father or, or you know somebody a brother you know uh, and i don't expect them to forgive me you know what i mean i know it's hard i know no, i wouldn't i wouldn't want to ask them to forgive me but i just wanted to ask them to let them know that i was sorry i don't know how to react if someone killed a, a close family member i'm not going to ask them to forgive me because you know i think about it and the warning starts the drug administration and you you start, you know, you start feeling it and I picture like what I'm going to say to the victim's family, what I'm going to say to my family and it starts taking an effect. I've done it a couple of times. I picture myself being strapped to that gurney and every time I do that, oh man, I, I get like anxious, you know, my heart starts racing. Uh, you know, a father or, or, you know, somebody, a brother, you know, I, and I don't expect them to forgive me, you know what I mean? The final day. On October 5th, 2022, John Henry Ramirez, who was 38 years old, was taken from the Polinsky unit in Livingston to the Huntsville unit, a 44-mile journey. Upon arrival, he was held in a cell until 6 p.m. when he was escorted to the chamber. But what Ramirez wasn't allowed to do was to pick his last meal. And that comes down to the state where he was punished. Inmates in a row across the U.S. don't have free reign to choose. For example, alcohol or tobacco are often off-limits nor are inmates allowed to order takeout from expensive restaurants. Usually, the meal has to be able to be prepared in-house at the prison. Some states have a spending limit for the meals, Florida, for example, limiting it to $40. But Texas doesn't allow any choice when it comes to requests. Since 2011, last meals have been ruled out by the Texas Department of Criminal Justice. This came after white supremacist and convicted lawyer Lawrence Russell Brewer ordered a gargantuan meal and when it arrived, didn't eat a bite, saying he wasn't hungry. At the time of Brewer's fatal punishment, when he refused his own elaborate last meal, Texas Senator John Whitmere called the meal privilege inappropriate. Enough is enough, he said. It is extremely inappropriate to give a person sentenced to their demise such a privilege. It's a privilege which the perpetrator did not provide to their victim. Thus, Ramirez ate the same his fellow inmates did for his last meal. While in the cell before he was taken to the chamber for his punishment, Ramirez expressed regret for his heinous crime and hoped that his punishment would provide some comfort to Castro's family. He reflected on his inability to make things right and hoped that his punishment would somehow help them find closure. Ramirez struggled to articulate his thoughts and emotions, acknowledging his remorse and love for his family and friends. 
but unable to express it in a way he wanted to. In a statement, Aaron Castro, the son of Pablo Castro, said mortals couldn't judge his father's slayer. Peace and love and justice for Pablo G. Castro. May his name not be forgotten, and may God have mercy in JHR, for it is not up to us. He is receiving his true judgment with our Lord and Savior, the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and end. A life taken away is not to be celebrated, but closure can definitely take place. I never loved them, I never touched them in my life. But I had to change a heart. I didn't know John Henry Ramirez has a kid. I don't want that hate cycle to continue. I mean, look at the hundreds and hundreds of people that are executed here. We are going to the Fifth Circuit to try to get a stay. They don't listen. Then we go to the Supreme Court to try to get a stay. They don't listen or they might listen. John Henry Ramirez has not been represented in the manner to which our Constitution guarantees him the right to be represented. Eleven witnesses watched as he was fatally punished by lethal injection, a process that took 14 minutes to take effect. Dana Moore, the lead pastor, was alongside Ramirez in the chamber, fulfilling a request Ramirez made during his scheduled punishment one year ago. In his last words, he apologized to the family for the heinous act he had committed and hoped that they could find some comfort in his punishment. He also said, To my wife, my friends, my son, Grasshopper, Dana and homies, I love y'all. Just know that I fought the good fight, and I'm ready to go. I am ready, Warden. During this time, Dana Moore placed his hand on Ramirez's chest and prayed for him to feel God's presence, and for everyone in the room to feel peace. Despite being unable to react to the prayer, Ramirez passed away with Moore by his side, and the coroner pronounced him deceased at 6.41 p.m. Moore expressed that he prayed for God's presence to be with Ramirez, and as he went to be with Jesus, and to bring comfort to all those who were affected by his demise. That's all for today, folks. See you next time.